Hello again, students. This is Professor Krauss coming to you with lecture number five, where we are going to look at who God is and why the truths of God, uh, who He is, how He has acted, actually is the foundation for our evangelism. Let me open us in prayer. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you that you are a sovereign God that we can trust and, and God that any discussion of evangelism needs to begin with you because you have a heart for sinners. Lord, we pray that you would help the information that we discuss and that we wrestle with, that we read each week, would be more than just knowledge uh, that, that sits in our head, but that it stirs our hearts to, to go into action and to love people and serve people and to ultimately share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, couple of uh, housekeeping issues um, that I wanted to um, to begin with. Uh, first, remember that each week you have a quiz that's going to be due, and it's going to be due on your reading. So these three books right here, and also God's Word, is what the, your quiz questions are going to come from you. Half of those points in each quiz is going to be based on you answering the question, have you completed all the reading? The other questions will be made up one or two per book. Uh, this is primarily just to keep you engaged in the reading, to make sure that you're not tempted just to skip over it. Or um, thinking about our second assignment each week, the weekly summary paper, that you don't just find one idea in the summary, write on it, and forget the rest but that you read throughout all of it. Um, Lord, it, it, it's, it's all good material, and so it will definitely help us think about evangelism and give us some great thoughts about uh, practicing evangelism. So, uh, with that in mind, remember each week you have a quiz, you have a summary. You can find those located in your e-learning. And uh, so, if you have any questions about that, make sure to reach out. So, this is officially... Week two, and we are looking at God and evangelism. And here is, here are, are two questions that I really believe uh, are, are foundational to a course like this. The first one is, why do we need to start with God with any discussion of evangelism? And number two, what is the potential downside if our starting point in evangelism is humanity. So I invite you to pause, to grab your notebook, drop down some ideas. It's something we're going to talk about in class, but for those of you who are online and not uh, going to be a part of those in-class discussions, think about this. Um, number one, we start with, with God in any discussion about evangelism because He is the center of all things. Uh, before we can ever have a heart or a, a passion uh, to to do evangelism, um, we have to begin with God. We have to recognize that we uh, we are saved only because of God's love. Now, when you get into the potential downside, there's a couple, but the main one is this: if we ever begin to think of evangelism as only something that is um, starting with humans uh, and our need for salvation, then we are going to be much more likely to begin, number one, to to rely solely on what we can do in our own strength. Uh, but also, number two, we're going to be willing to take shortcuts. We're going to begin to possibly think about salvation and evangelism, mission, making disciples, all those ideas uh, from a human side without stepping back and thinking about what God and His Word have told us. If, if we start with humanity and our need for salvation when we think about evangelism, uh, then a lot of times we're going to begin to, um, to do things or to practice evangelism in ways that we might not normally do so. Why? Because we've taken God out of the equation. Uh, we're only thinking about ourselves and that person. Um, and we've really forgotten where evangelism comes from and why evangelism is even a thing. So to, to, to keep us from doing that, I thought it would be very helpful early on here in our course 
to really start with God. Yes, we've we've defined the gospel in a very general way. We're going to build on that. We've talked about evangelism in a pretty general way. We're definitely going to build on that. But now let's start with God and, and see what we can learn about God and how that's going to shape our evangelism. First is the idea God is sovereign. From cover to cover, we are entered uh, the Bible. We are introduced to a God who is in control. He rules over the entire universe. He rules over everything that is created. So, how does that truth that God is sovereign, that He is over all things, He's in control of all things, how does that help you think about and practice evangelism? Pause for a second and think about that. All right, here are three obvious ones. Number one, the results of evangelism are not up to us. And this is an idea that we're going to continue to return to because of how essential it is uh, for us being able to maintain a passion for evangelism. As soon as we begin to think that evangelism all is entirely based on us and how well we can speak, how well we can argue, how much information we know. Um, The more we do that, the more we leave God out of the equation and we're going to begin to practice evangelism in a way that we shouldn't. And number two, we are going to be crushed by the weight of thinking that it's all up to us. Number two, we can trust God to save. Uh, Part of God's sovereignty is His will to save sinners. Uh, We are not God, and yet we know from His Word that God uses us um, to be a part of the evangelism of making disciples of His mission. And we can go into every uh, time of prayer for the lost, every conversation with the lost, trusting that God can and will save. And finally, three, nothing uh, can stop God from bringing about His will. And this is... Think about this on a very, very practical level. How many times have you, if you if you are active in sharing your faith with those who are not Christians, how often have you left and your first, you know, your first thoughts are, well, I really messed that up. I probably, you know, said something or did something that might have kept them from becoming a Christian, right? And and listen. There, there are certainly things we find in God's Word that teach us about evangelism that we're going to see in our next lecture. There are certain ways that we can talk to people and listening and stuff that we're going to talk about that are important for evangelism. But in the end, nothing can stop God from bringing about His will. You misspeaking or making a mistake or something like that is not going to stop God from bringing about His will. And so we can step back and we can go into evangelism with full confidence that our God is greater than anything we might do, greater than the person who is lost in their sin He can and does save. Number two, God created us to know Him. All right, this is one of those ideas that it just baffles me every time I begin to really think about it. That the God of the entire universe, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, love us so much, sinful human beings, um, knowing that we would sin, He still created us. And He didn't just create us to be slaves, but He created us to be in relationship with Him. God desires, and God does know us, and God desires that we know Him. If you think back to the garden, God from the very beginning initiated the relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden. God created the garden for them to dwell in. It's many authors have pointed out it's like a mini temple where God would be with his people. Now, because of Adam and Eve's disobedience, because God Adam and Eve distrusted God, but they rebelled against God, um, sin fractured their relationship. And shame and, and guilt became a part of, of, of their life, Adam and Eve's life, so that that relationship with God was not the way it should be. So, what happens? Well, we find throughout the biblical story, God continues over and over and over to make a way for us to be with Him. It's not us who initially or faithfully seeks after God, but God who initially and faithfully seeks after us. 
You know, we are ignorant of God's love and ignorant of salvation apart from God's grace. And so evangelism, uh, when we begin with God and we sit across the table or we are um, on the phone with someone who's lost and we are sharing the good news of Jesus with them, it, it's helpful to remember that this is an image bearer that God created uh, to be in relationship with. Um, and, and that this person, while they may be ignorant of salvation and may not know Jesus right now, um, evangelism reminds us that God does want to be in relationship with them. And so that can help us remember the person across from us is you know, not first and foremost, I guess in the way we think about people when we're sharing the gospel, a sinner, first and foremost, they're an image bearer. They are created by God to know them. And now sin has fractured that relationship and it needs to be reconciled. God is holy. God is holy in His purity. God is holy in His otherness. God is God is God, and we are not. And so evangelism invites sinners to move away from themselves, to take their eyes off of themselves and their lives and put it on a God who is holy and infinitely greater than, than they are. Evangelism invites sinners to admit their sin um, and to turn to a God that does save and a God that does love them, a God who is holy and a God who can bestow upon them the righteousness, the goodness, the purity that they need in order to be in a relationship. Um, starting with God in evangelism reminds us holiness is not something that we or anyone else can earn. It has to be declared upon someone. It has to be given. Uh, God loves the world. <laughs> You know, at, the longer we're Christians, the longer this very simple, basic truth uh, might slip from our minds. Um, evangelism begins with the understanding that God truly does love a sinful world. If God did not love the world, if God did not love sinners, what is the point of doing evangelism, right? There, there would be no hope or faith that God would, would save them. But we believe... Because of God's word, because of Jesus, that God loves sinners. He loves the world that is now alienated from him and desires for them um, to come to salvation. You know, remember John 3.16, you know, the longer we're Christians too, John 3.16 might seem like an overly simplistic, like we want to get to the deep, meaty stuff of God's word, but wow, John 3.16 helps us to really understand that, that God loved the world in this way that He gave. You know, God sacrificed. God sent His one and only begotten Son that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. And 3.17 goes into the, God did not send uh, Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that through Jesus the world might be saved. And so these verses and so many others remind us of God's passionate, faithful love for the world. Romans 5, 8, where Paul says, but God demonstrated his love for sinners, right? It's not that God demonstrated his love for people who got their act together or, or people who wanted to be saved, but that God first uh, demonstrated his love by sending Jesus into the world for sinners. When we were at our worst, God still loved us and sent his son and, uh, to die for us that we can, be, we can repent and, and know God's love in relationship. I want to invite you to, to pause the, uh, the, the lecture for a moment and turn to Romans 1 and, and read verses 18 through 25 and then come back whenever you're done. So we're not going to read this together for the sake of time, but in Romans 1, Paul really lays out the desperate state of our hearts apart from Jesus. Paul wants us to see, you know, this is the very beginning of this whole entire section where Paul lays out that we've all broken the law. The wages of sin is death, you know. No one is good. All have turned from God to their own ways. Roman 1 starts off saying, hey, we are all stubborn and hard-hearted. God has revealed himself in all of creation, um, even in our own in our own selves, and yet we are. Uh, have denied who God is. We've suppressed that truth and we've chosen to love God's gifts rather than loving the giver. And so, you know, when we think about who we were before Jesus, 
we we remember that it's God who changes our hearts. That it's not that we came to God first and then God met us halfway, but no, we were dead in our sins and unable to be made alive again. And so it is God who changes hearts. It's God who softens hearts. Think about how powerful this truth is when it comes to praying for the lost and and loving the lost who are very, very difficult to love and to share the gospel with. It reminds us not to ever give up, give up because there's no one too far gone. Uh, that, that we, we believe that it's not up to us to judge how far someone is away from God, but for us to hold to that truth that God does change and God does soften hearts so that if we continue to preach the gospel, people will be saved. Why? Because God is greater than sinful hearts and God loves the world. Uh, we have to remember as Christians, as the church, that God uses His people The church is plan A for salvation for the world. The church is plan A for your lost family members and the lost who attend your church services and the lost uh, uh, kids in your household and the lost parents in the neighborhood. The church is plan A. God uses His ordinary people like us In the power of the Holy Spirit, He causes us to be able to do extraordinary work like sharing the good news powerfully, not because we're powerful, but because God in us is powerful and His Word spoken by us is powerful. So God, we need to believe, we need to start with God in evangelism so that we believe with all our heart that God can use the weak and strong, rich and poor, educated and uneducated to see salvation brought about in the world. When we are saved, our entire identity changes. It is no longer me, Philip Krause, the old Philip, but now I am a child of God and and I've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to receive a mission and to participate in God's mission, not individually, but as His church, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with the lost and to make disciples of all nations. We need to believe that God is gracious and merciful. Again, if we begin with human beings, sinners, in our desire to uh, share the gospel, then we are going to be frustrated and give up because we're going to come um, to people who are frustrating and people who uh, continue to deny God and uh, we're just going to be like, God, we, I tried, I've given up. But we believe that God is gracious and merciful even to the worst of sinners. I mean, look at Paul, look at Moses, look at David. Um, God doesn't give us the law to give to people. God did not save us by the law saying, hey, do better. But God has saved us, um, uh, saved us not on our ability to keep the law, but God has saved us by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. So again, Something as simple as starting with God's grace and mercy should well up in us a desire to pray and to pray powerful prayers, pray um, you know, passionate prayers for those who are lost because we believe that our God is gracious and merciful to save sinners. And, and we need to, building on that, we need to believe that God moves through prayer. Time and time again, we see in God's Word that God moves through the prayers of His people. Not that God is a genie in the bottle, but that God loves His people. He treasures um, the, the, the prayers of His people. If you think about the book of Exodus and how it starts out in Exodus 3, and in Exodus 3, um, we're, we're just meeting uh, Moses, and we're learning about his mission where God is going to send him to Um, Pharaoh. But right before that, at the end of chapter 2, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Even more, we know God then acts. So we got to believe as the church that we, um, when we, when we pray, and, and our, our will is, a, is in line with God's will that God is going to move in some way to bring salvation, to change hearts, to transform people and families and neighborhoods and schools and workplaces. It's a reminder, don't stop praying. Again, if we begin with 
people and sinners, when we think about evangelism, we're eventually going to throw in the towel because it's just too hard. It's too frustrating. But if we begin with God and we believe uh, completely by faith that God moves through prayer, then we are going to pray and pray and pray and not just pray for physical needs, which is important, but we're going to pray powerful prayers that God, the Lord of the harvest, would raise up uh, missionaries to go into the, the world and share the gospel. He's going to raise up people in our church to go and share the gospel that many are going to be saved. So we need to begin with God. It's not only biblically right for us to begin with God, but even practically when we think about praying and serving and loving and sharing, it all goes back to who God is, what He's done, and what He's called us to. Maybe you have some other things you'd like you you think about when you know what else is true about God that helps us better understand evangelism and how we should practice it. There's a lot more we could say, but I think this is a good starting point for thinking about God and evangelism. In the next lecture, we're going to look at Scripture and what it teaches us about evangelism. I hope this uh, this lecture was encouraging. I hope it renewed a passion in you to pray and to go to God and to to be bold and and to persevere in evangelism. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments, leave them in YouTube or on one of the comments, or you can shoot me an email. But I appreciate your attention, and um, God bless, and I'll be praying for you.